Welcome back to the Line Podcast. My name is Aaron Alexander. This is a place that we bring together the world's leading experts in all things health and wellness to help you optimize your mind, body, and movement. This conversation was with someone that I am proud and honored to call a good friend, Stephanos Sifandos. He is a relationship coach. He is a men's coach, and he is a tremendous human being. He is the husband of Christine Hassler, who we had on just a couple weeks ago. So I was very excited to get to share both their conversations, kind of almost back to back. And uh, in this conversation, we get into a lot of different layers of who the heck we are as men or human beings representing masculinity in the first place. Just reading a, a little quote off of his website. As men, we are often given a blueprint of the world, relationships, and life that is hyper-selfish, not conducive to the well-being of others, and emotionally disconnected and void of feeling. This conversation, we get into that. How do we feel safe enough in ourselves, confident enough in ourselves, whole enough to be able to express, sit with, comfortably or uncomfortably, but being comfortable with discomfort in all the, the... nooks and crannies, however dark or light that uh, we may be. I think that Stephanos acts as a really tremendous example on how to really be a, a whole integrated masculine presence. And that doesn't always look like chopping wood or swinging kettlebells or spitting. It can also look like crying or look like feeling insecure or feeling vulnerable or feeling afraid. And by opening ourselves up to these parts that sometimes we might have learned are shameful or you know, if we do express them, then you know, we'll push people away or we won't be accepted or anything of the sort. What a mindfuck to be in that position where there's a thing that we feel deeply and we're afraid to express it so we just keep packing it down packing it down packing it down it doesn't go away none of these little kernels of fear or guilt or shame they don't just go away by pushing them back in and swallowing them they end up festering and smoldering and you think of it as like an old piece of food get some old crusty piece of cheesecake and say, I don't know, you're a complete weirdo and you put the cheesecake under a carpet and you don't see it anymore, but eventually it starts to smell. You go into the house, you're like, God, this place smells a little bit like old cheesecake. And then with time, that cheesecake starts to grow and there's microorganisms and started off as a perfectly fine socially acceptable piece of cheesecake and then with time if it wasn't tended to correctly where you can just maybe throw the leftover bits into a compost and it could start to get turned around and then you can put it into some soil and it's exposed to light and eventually it turns into a garden all of a sudden you're getting vegetables and zucchinis and carrots and roses or whatever that's the potential of what we can do if we address our old pieces of crusty cheesecake. Cheesecake is really a terrible analogy. Maybe an old bologna sandwich. If we put the rest of that thing into the compost, it can turn into a beautiful garden. If we just stashed it under the rug because we were lazy, we didn't feel like actually doing the work to take it to the compost, then it starts to fester, it starts to grow, it starts to smell disgusting, and it becomes this monster under your rug. So out of sight will not last for very long. And so in this conversation, we get into how we can start addressing the old, crusty, moldy, baloney sandwiches of our consciousness that we've stashed underneath our rugs. It's very late right now, hence why this introduction is probably ridiculous. So really fun conversation. Stephanus is fantastic. He is someone that I admire, someone that I appreciate, and someone that I'm very excited to share with y'all. So if you enjoyed this conversation, share with your homies, share with your grandma, share with your neighbors, leave some reviews on iTunes or Spotify or what have you. And uh, I really appreciate that. I read them. I appreciate them. I appreciate you. I appreciate you telling your friends. I appreciate you listening to this. And uh, let's get into the scheduled programming with my dog, Stephanos Sifandos. Pow. I usually start 
most podcasts with uh, French kissing my guest. So well. let's turn the lights down <laughs> <Well>. and <laughs> let's just, French get, it, let's just, just like get, it, get it started. <laughs> Passion. What's that? <laughs> Ew, did you know what that was? I remember. Oh, yes. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> All right. Um, hopefully that stops. There's all these second. voices. We're using a new recording system here at my good buddy Justin Rizvani's home. And uh, we're in Austin, Texas, visiting yeah. a new location. I'm here with my friend Steph, who I'm very excited to, to get to know more. We've kind of like superficially been around each other. I've gotten to see how you have like a lot of depth I've really appreciated getting to dig into. And since listening to the podcasts of you on other people's shows, I've like really enjoyed taking all these notes and I'm like really honored to get to share some time with you, man. man likewise, man. When you asked me to be on, I was like, yeah, we're going to have some fucking fun. Yeah, absolutely. Man. One of the things I thought was really cool was you did like a like a walkabout of sorts. You did, was it six day fast yeah. and all Vision things? Yeah. Why did you do that? It sounds incredibly uncomfortable. Uh, yeah, yes and no. It was, so it was a, a 10 or 11 days, but it was a so five and a half, six day on your own vision quest up in um, near Yosemite, speaking, near Independence was the town. So, I don't know, 45 minutes, an hour from there up. Elevation was about 10,000 feet. So high alpine desert, really nice spot. Yeah. I mean, I positioned myself where I could see all of Yosemite, basically. It was, it was phenomenal. So no food, just water, um, stay in a spot and just sit. No devices, no, you know, no reading materials, nothing. Mm. I had a journal, pen ran out, so that was obviously, well, not meant to do so much. Did turn into a Vipassana? <laughs> but, oh, yeah, Have you done sure. Vipassana? No, I haven't done a proper 10-day, no. Okay. I'm but, sure what you did is vastly more difficult. I mean, I was... I didn't speak for six days, so yeah. I was just by myself and didn't speak for six days. That was interesting. Was that something that was, were you shepherded by some other community or guidance or teacher? Or was there some something, some coordination or was it just your own thing? No, it was some coordination. So my cool. friend Jetty, yeah, Jetty Azuma, it's a rite of passage for men. So I trust him. He's, a, he's an amazing guy. I've, I've served with him or, you know, served medicine with him at Sacred Sons event. I've seen him in action. He just has a lot of integrity and, and just grounded wisdom, and I thought, this is something that I'd like to do and I'd like to experience, and it was great, man. Just being alone, it was very sad leaving. I cried for a long time. I felt very disjointed from the world. And when I came out, they'd recently put more COVID laws in place, and it was, like, it was more strict, and I just felt all this expansion, being by myself out there, didn't want to leave, and then coming back into the, you know, quote-unquote real world, it was just very intense, and I felt very disorientated for a number of days. What was the cycles like? Like during my only reference point would be Vipassana mm -hmm. and there's there's days, you know, most people leave on the fourth and the sixth day, I believe, if I remember correctly. Was there stages throughout that six-day period that was super challenging and more like expansive or, you know, what was yeah. like the, the cycles like? So my biggest apprehension or fear was going in there and thinking I'm going to be afraid of the dark. Legit, right? Because I thought, I'm out there, there's no tent, just sleeping bag and stars and like, what about the animals? Whatever animals may be out there, insects, scorpions, all of that, you know, yeah. spiders. And I got a little, I got a little concerned and um, first night just fell straight asleep. It was awesome. Yeah. And that, it conquered something for me and it gave me a reference point of what was I actually scared of? And so when you ask about cycles, I don't mean to say this in any arrogance or in, a, in, a, in an egoic way. I felt I wanted more time because fasting for me is very familiar. I fast often, long stints of fasting. The most I've done is only nine days, but I, I've just, I've done that number of times. I'm very accustomed to it. So the food wasn't an issue. I did run out of water on 12 to 15 hours before um, we were going to go back and meet. Yeah. So that was a concern, obviously, because I haven't been without water for so long. <laughs> yeah, so I ran out of water. Um, that was okay. I had a storm in the last night. We all had storms. So there was, there was, must have been about 10 of us, and we were all in different locations. So cool. we were all by ourselves. And we had a massive storm the last night. It was epic. That challenged me a little bit because I can't tie knots for shit. I, I had a tarp. I had to position the tarp somewhere so I wouldn't get drenched. I did a good job. I didn't get wet. I hacked it, but I did it. And that, that was a, a proud moment for me as well because I'm not 
I'm a nature person, but I'm not a, a super handy person. So I knew that would be challenging me as well. I mean, it's just a lot of time to think and feel. I just spent a lot of time sitting and just, just looking out at the distance. Thinking about things, not thinking about things, laying down, resting. I really didn't do much. And I'm a really, you know, quote-unquote busy person. And it was just really nice to not do anything, not have any responsibilities, have no one to get back to, have no one to have to, you know, entertain or support or just be in, in other people's energies. And it just felt really empowering to just be on my lonesome. What were the takeaways that you got from that experience? I need more nature. The world needs more nature. Not, yeah. to, not to imprint my projections onto the world, but I, I think, you know, it's been something that we've been missing for a long time in modern society. I need more quiet time and silent time. I really, I really crave that and I thrive in that space. You know, doing difficult things or immersing myself into the unknown more often is very useful for me. It gives me a, a real reference point for, you know, expanding myself. Like, okay, what am I actually capable of? What am, what am I not only here to do, but who am I here to be? And I, and I don't know that if I don't venture into spaces of the unknown. Mm. And that, that really is unknown. Like I said, I went in there fearful of the dark. <laughs> so it was really interesting. And it's sort of embarrassing to even admit. I feel a little embarrassed to say it. I'm, you know, I'm just, I was scared of dark when I was a kid, but I don't know why. That was what was happening in my home. But I know as an adult, it was just strange to think that. But... That was a very real thing. So I went in there with that, thinking, okay, well, I'm going to just have to be with this. Something that I think, Paul, and listening to your stuff, that I appreciate about you is I feel like a lot of the words that are easily picked up if you live in places like Venice or maybe like Boulder, Colorado or Portland, Oregon, mm -hmm. you know, is like emotional intelligence and doing the work and, you know, masculine energy and feminine energy. Hold all these, space. You know, hold space. <laughs> 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 and all of those things, like, at the root of them, it's like, yeah, it's really important. You know, and then, you know, passing through various different hands, it's kind of just those words have been rolled through the dirt. And then I've got all kinds of barnacles and stains. And it's, it's like I personally oftentimes create distance between me and a lot of those words because I don't want to be associated with that kind of like the spiritual bypassing, which has now become another one of those words. Yeah. But it seems like you do a really tactful job at navigating that in a – a grounded manner. I'm very cognizant of it. Yeah. Like you, I often can mock and judge that. <laughs> and I mean, I'm, I'm, I can be very judgmental sometimes. So, But I mock that. But when I actually unpack that, I think to myself, well, what do these things actually mean in context to something? When you say hold space, what does it actually mean? So I want to unpack that. What does it mean for me pragmatically in my life? When I'm doing that for someone or someone's doing that for me, what does it actually mean? And so as I started to look more into that, for me, it means if I'm holding space for someone, if you're coming to me with an issue or some pain or some fear, I don't want to be triggered by that, right? Because if I'm triggered by that, I'm unconsciously sending you a signal through my body, through the empathetic resonance of us attuning to each other, saying that I can't handle this. You're just going to feel more unsafe and you're going to shut down and it's going to reinforce whatever threat you're feeling. So I'm not really holding space. Now, the only way I can do that and I can do it or continue at least to strive to do it well is to work on my shit, another one of those terms. That means the shadow work, another one of those terms. But that just means for me unpacking the stuff that I don't know. If I'm easily being reactive or agitated at something and that's a pattern for me and it bugs me and it makes me feel uncomfortable and unpleasant, that's a shadow. That's something that I don't like, something that I'm not owning. It's something that I'm disregarding and I'm not doing the work around it. So then it's my responsibility that as a friend and a brother, you come to me with an issue. If it triggers me, I can't hold space for you. So I either have to be really honest and say, hey, I actually, I don't know if I can hear you in the way you need to, or I do my work and be a friend, I suppose, in the, in the way that I want to be a friend and be able to hold that space for you. It seems like you've, you've cultivated more depth within yourself to be able to be a broader container to be of support for another person. How does a person do that within themselves without it just being like an intellectual wanking type experience. Yeah, you well, that's such a good term as well. I'm fighting this press right now. Uh, <laughs> well, it was intellectual wankery for me for a long time. That was my issue. I would yeah. talk great talk, but I wasn't integrated and embodied. I think a lot of times those are the most wounded people, the people that have yeah. the most elaborate compensatory verbal patterns, which saying something like that, obviously I'm a wounded person. Yeah. <laughs> 
I think Clearly. all wounded people to some degree. <laughs> I think, you know, if, if growth is inevitable, right, if we're, our eyes are blinking, our hearts are beating and we're, you know, we're moving through the world, if growth is inevitable, then wounding is inevitable, you know. I mean, the amount of fucking information we process unconsciously and implicitly on a, on a second-to-second -second basis is ridiculous compared to the conscious amount of information. We're going to store stuff that is not going to necessarily make us feel great. It will come up later in our bodies, in our speak, in our whatever it is, in our emotions, right? Um, to answer your question, I, I really hit rock bottom, man, in every area of my life multiple times and it was just pain is the answer for me. I think this is my observation of humanity and I'm part of humanity but this is very true for me so I'll speak for myself. I don't really have an issue being politically quote-unquote incorrect. I'm not a person that's derogatory by nature but I don't have an issue being politically incorrect. So my observation of humanity is that we learn through pain. That's where we are collectively at the moment. Like our collective consciousness is like, it's just look at what's happening in the world. We have to, it's like, oh, okay, I'll change now because I've lost my leg. I'll change now because yeah. I've lost my relationship. Or I've lost everything or I've, I've been cheating on someone for so long or, you know, that's a pattern in my relationships or I'm a drug abuser or whatever it is and now it's time to change. But we don't, generally don't change until we hit rock bottom. We need the contrast. And, and I, that was me. I was just, oh, man. I was an addict in so many different ways and I was just killing myself. What kind of ways? A sex addict, mm. pornography, love addict, love compulsion. I'm, the term love addict is, I don't know, I'm a bit iffy with it. I'm still trying to figure that out. But love compulsion, you know, like I was seeking validation outside of myself through how, what others thought about me, whether it was romantic partnerships, sex, friends, whatever, you know. Never really drugs, alcohol for a short period of time, adrenaline, status, wealth, materialism, like all of that. Mm. Wanted to be seen in a particular light. Needed to be seen in a particular light. What were the roots from your present purview of all of that? Yeah. Which Even, your present purview may change in, mm. after this conversation or yeah, six months or six yeah, years or yeah, whatever. Sure. But from where you stand now, what do you feel like that's... And, and you know, yeah, what do you, what do you feel? Yeah, for me then and, you know, even now sometimes... It's that unconscious need for validation from my father that I didn't get as a young boy. That was what really drove me. And maybe that's a story that I just told myself. Maybe it's bullshit. Maybe it's not true, right? Maybe as I started to unpack, okay, what's the cause of all this, that came to my awareness. I thought, huh, that makes sense. That feels right. I'll stick with that. I'll work with it. I'll undo it. And then let's see what my life turns out like. Yeah been turning out differently the last few years. And I'm not saying that's the only cause. I know that I grew up in a tumultuous environment, so violence, volatility, emotional, physical abuse, a lot of uncertainty, disorganisation in my mind, um, eating issues, eating disorders, like using food as a crux, overweight, low self-confidence, getting bullied, being the bully, violence, like just lots of bad shit that I used to do and was done to me, right? Yeah. Playing the victim, personality patterns that I developed, so many different things that I think I'm still undoing. I'm not, you know, I'm not immune to them, that's for sure. They leak out. It seems like the, the image that's coming up for me is it's almost like, you know, we are a bunch of books and some people have more robustly detailed books and the story is, it's like, wow, it makes sense. You're like, you had a good editor. <laughs> you know, like, wow, like it's seamless. And some other people's books, it's like maybe certain chapters are really well filled in. Maybe it's the father chapter, you know, whatever it is. They've really gone deep on that chapter. But then there's these disparate gaps between there. And my sense is that would lead to a lot of internal kind of like friction type sensation. Yeah, chaos. I was never happy. I was never happy with who I was or what I was achieving or what I was experiencing. I always wanted more. I was very, you know, self-conscious and about myself, about my body, about how I presented the things that I said. You know, I, I, I felt very disorientated in life and I didn't know what I wanted. I, I didn't have clarity. Like, I didn't have that certainty and that obviously not having certainty made me feel more confused and so I, I felt I needed to compensate for that in some ways and I did so through being very aggressive in my demeanour and behaviour and that was a learned behaviour as well, just familiar to me, but it helped me feel safer and in control. I have language around this because this is also what I do in the world. Yeah, you know, like, you've practised it. Yeah, and, and I've also studied psychology and behavioural science. I still do. I'm a perpetual student. I mean, much, much like yourself in different ways. I'm always wanting to know more about what does this human condition actually mean. So I have language around this, but for a long time I didn't. Yeah, for a long time I didn't, and for a long time I did, but didn't know what to do with it. 
Yeah. I was, it wasn't in integrity because I wasn't living it because I was too scared to go touch my traumas or actually deal with them. Yeah. To continue down the, the book analogy, have you, through your journey of, of yourself, have you managed to reassociate some seemingly disassociated chapters? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. How does a person even get to the point of being able to acknowledge that they have a story line that they're continually writing and have the option to edit if they so choose. And then from that point, once you have that level of self-empowerment, how do you begin the process of actually making edits? You have to be willing to change. And I think the next step is surround yourself with people or groups or someone that can be a mirror in your life that can say, hey, what about that? That can be an observer. Whether it's a counselor, psychologist, a coach, a group, a friend, a group that you just hang and you meet with every month and you just challenge yourselves, call yourselves forward, you ask to be the best versions of yourselves and what does that look like? You ask yourselves really big questions. Nothing wrong with superficial conversation, I just think we stay there too long. I think that's the issue. The superficial conversation is necessary to get to know someone on so many different levels, right, and to become intimate and share, which I think most of us want. We've evolved for so many different reasons, but one of the core reasons we've evolved the way that we have is through socialization, intimacy, bonding, connecting. We ultimately want that and we want to be able to share safe space with people. So having a mirror in your life or mirrors in your life and really being open and willing to see and just saying, where can I change? Hey, I love my life and could it be better? Yeah. Do you feel like within your own self there's any parts that you don't love? Oh, you yeah. You haven't figured out a way to like... For sure. For sure, I can tell you some of them now. My shame, my anger. Mm. I, I still get is my frustration. Is it your? I'm always curious with that. Is it is it yours or is it the? Or what's the best language? So Advaita Vedanta, which is a philosophy that I follow. Are you familiar with that by any yeah, chance? Yeah, yeah. Great. Yeah. So I deeply follow that. It would say it's not mine. It's it's a thing. It's an object. Yeah. And the subject and the object, or the observer and the observed, are completely different. It's like an inhabitant. Yeah. And basically, I, yeah. You know, this vessel is the yeah. body that that's presently choosing. Probably subconsciously, perhaps, you know, during this conversation, it's like, oh, you know, conscious, but, yeah. you know, we're choosing to, to welcome that inhabitant. Yeah, yeah, and, and through maybe patterns or just habitual nature, and it's not completely mine, but that philosophy aside or that, that view of reality aside, it's the anger that resides within me, me not being the body. Yes, it resides within the body, but the body and the mind are also objects, right? Because if you can think about the mind, then it's an object and it, the subject is the one that's thinking about the mind. The subject is the ultimate consciousness, right? Yeah. And I listen to hours of this every day. That's right. And I still, still can't grasp. Like I can and I can't. It's just so, it's very meaningful to me. But the anger, the shame, I know that it's not mine. It's so deeply embedded in my neurology and my behaviour, and I've definitely shifted it. So I know that it's possible to move it because who I am now compared to who I was three years ago, five years ago, a year ago, it's very different. Yeah. And it, I'm very deliberate with being aware of that and engaging in practices, taking more responsibility for that. I never used to do a lot of that. I would just project. If someone upset me, I would make it their fault, mm -hmm. blame them. I'd you know, and I'd be bigger than, I'd make myself bigger than them. And if I made myself bigger than them and they kept making themselves bigger, then we'd just end up physically fighting. That was my MO, you mm. know. I wonder if you ever let go of those neuroses. Like that's like, I'm sure you've heard Ram Dass mm. talk about this before. I've heard it quoted a bunch of times. How at one point he had these monstrous neuroses that would, is that how you say the plural of neurosis? Neuroses? I don't really know. I thought it was... Neurosis, plural, like... Or neuroses? Like, like lamb. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it wasn't I so wish I had a right, we have this dictionary. Or I've never used a sound right machine before. <laughs> <laughs> and it's this big board. And there's eight different, but we should probably at some point hit all eight. Yes, I don't even know which one you're hitting. I apologize. The yellow one okay, is, great. is the... Uh, but what he said that I thought was great was that at one point there was these monstrous neuroses, we'll just call it that. Yes. And they kind of, they bossed him around and they controlled him and all that stuff. And there was this resistance and this push and wow. And then now he still has all of the same ones. It's just now instead of these being these big monsters, they're these, they're like these little children. And they can come into the house and they can, you know, hang out and have tea. And it's like you can have this relationship with these. And it's not this cutting or dropping or pushing, which perhaps in from my perception, would actually add energy into that. 
charge it up with the push. Mm. I wonder if perhaps the recipe could be coming to a place of acceptance and love. And, you know, that acceptance and love ends up becoming kind of this, like, light of sorts that, that um, I don't know, it, is there any of those that cannot be healed through love, I guess? I don't think so. I think in that instance Ram Dass has nailed it because for me, I don't know if it ever shifts from us behaviorally, neurologically, whatever, molecularly, if that's a word, but at a molecular level. Yeah. I don't think it needs to. I think the relationship needs to shift to it, mm. which is, you know, what you just said about them becoming these small children that are more manageable now. And that, that's been true for me. The loving presence, the empathetic resonance, the compassion, the kindness, the love, that application to self, and that's very hard. It's been very hard for me because I've been so intense and so aggressive that there's a very outward energy, but that, that energy coming in and being very loving, that is so healing on so many levels, physiologically, emotionally. It creates space in the body and the mind to actually go down a path of, oh, what's an alternative perspective here? Which is what I think Ram Das is speaking to as well. It's, can I take an alternative perspective to this thing that has caused me so much pain for so long? Can I see it and feel it and interact with it differently? Does my relationship shift to it? Yeah. Something that oftentimes I end up being able to feel much more compassion for myself and you know just everything, other people, all things, if I do perceive them through the lens of a child. And so oftentimes I'll give myself little pats in the back and like, you know, like, good work, little Aaron. You know, good, like, yeah. young Aaron, like, you're doing a good job. Yeah. You know, as opposed to being like, you suck, whatever the, the word yeah. that people, I don't typically have a lot of you suck. There is like not enough. You know, I have a lot yeah. of comparison. Would be, Do you ever have my thing. very negative or negative harsh in a speak? Not a lot. Yeah, yeah I don't have like the, Fuck you, yeah. you piece of shit. I don't, yeah. I don't really get a lot of yeah. that. It's more my negative, I think, is almost worse because it's more apathetic, which I would take fuck you over apathy personally. You know, not to, not to, you know, no, have a dick, a, you know, a dick measuring contest no, of no, like whose internal it. bummers are, are, are grander. Um, they both hurt. I experience both the not enoughness, the unworthiness. Well, the fuck you has energy to it. Yeah. That's how a lot of people motivate themselves. Yeah. That's how I did for a long Whereas time. Whereas the disassociated apathy, that, that's kind of just this deflated, oh. Yeah. <laughs> Which I can, I can love that too, I think. I mean, that's the whole point, is can we love all of it, even the shit that we don't like? Mm. That's the shadow walking, right? It's that. Yeah. It's can we apply love to the places within us that we detest. Yeah. And so it seems like, to, to, to borrow someone else's term, it's like, it's like a process one could perhaps go through a process of reparenting in a sense. You know, and, and I wonder if, is that something that resonates with you? And if so, how, how would a person begin the process of a healthy reparenting relationship? Yeah, it, it definitely resonates with me. And, and Christine, which, well, I know you through Christine, so I was going to say, of course, yeah. you know Christine, but um, we teach a lot of inner child work. And it's a big part of our models of, I don't want to say therapy, but coaching and teaching and, and, and helping others. For me, it's been a game changer personally, man. To be able to reparent those parts of me that feel really disconnected, and I'm mindful with the word disassociated because, in psychological terms, we're almost talking about like mind chasm, like uh, schizophrenia and bipolar disorders yeah. and so forth. But th there is an element of just detachment or disconnection, like you just so Maybe like lost. A, like a, a numbing or like yeah. a, a stashing away yeah. or a pushing aside. Yeah. It could yeah. be lighter language. Yeah, yeah. And so the reparenting process, at a simple level, how do we begin that? I think commencing with getting to know those parts of you. So if you were to have a child or if you were to have a little puppy or you know, even, even if you're looking after your best friend's kid or your, your sibling's kid and you just had a lot of love for them and they maybe did something quote-unquote wrong or they were upset or sad, how would you connect and communicate with them? You know, if you're a sane person, if you're not pathological, right, you would treat them with empathy and compassion. You would ask them questions. You'd be curious about where their pain is coming from. You'd want to create a safe space. You'd get down on their level. You wouldn't tower over them. Your tone and your afflictions and your pitch and all of that would change, right? Apply that to your inner self. Yeah. That's basically it as a starting point. I think that's very accessible for everyone. It's just very difficult for people to do because they're either not accustomed to it, it feels strange, awkward, or... They don't want to do it because it doesn't feel comfortable. What are the hardest days like for you? Shame. Mm. Yeah, that's what it is. It's shame for me. It's not anger. Or, I mean... Is there like a consistent flavor of the shame? Uh, yeah, not enough. 
I fucked up. I don't like life as a restlessness in my body, an mm. agitation, and I want short-term gratification to fix it, whether it's pornography or you know, the old way start coming to prostitution, sex. Um, I'm going to go out in the gym and just train for three hours and just burn myself, like really hurt myself so that I don't feel... It's a numbing, essentially. I'm putting all effort into other areas as, instead of dealing with the emotional stuff. I get very angry and agitated. I'll drop up a spoon and I lose my shit. You know what I mean? Like I can't do something like the, the oven heater's not working or something, you know, the, the knob for the oven and, I don't know, it's not catching a light and I'll just lose my mind. Literally as if, I don't know, I had a car accident or something. And it still happens. It just doesn't happen as often yeah. and it doesn't happen for as long. But it's, I still do. And when that happens, how do you address that experience? Well, it depends on the situation. In other words, who's in my environment? So, you know, I work from home and so does Christine. So she sometimes bears the brunt of that. Mm. And we have agreements in how we operate with that. And, you know, having her there, she's very good at being compassionate and very open-hearted and applying love to those parts of me that are really wounded, that are just, it's just old stuff coming up that I, um, I'm sort of not really dealing with. And she just reminds me that she's not the enemy, that this can pass and that if I just rest and apply love to these areas, it will pass faster. And that honestly is the key, man, is what you said before. Like, you know, love those parts of, of self. That, that really is, is the key. And so I just try and be a little more proactive. There has to be discipline there. There has to be assertiveness. There has to be a level of resilience because you've got to go into the pain. I don't want to avoid it. So what I like to do is move energy. So I'll either go for a walk or a jog or I'll sit in the air dine or something. Just cruise. It's not high-intensity work. It's just to move energy. And then I'll do some thinking if I want. I'll have a breath practice. I want to be responsible. I'll have a sound practice as well as part of my breath practice. That helps me move energy and give context to what I'm experiencing. Sometimes I'll write some stuff down if I need to. If I'm feeling anger, if there's some anger or charge behind that, I'll go hit a boxing bag or I'll smash pillows or scream into pillows, whatever. Like I want to move the energy and then I want to come back and address it and be as responsible as I can. It doesn't always work that way. Sometimes I just have to weather the storm. I wonder if those reactions are something to be cut away or something to be you know, dropped or whatever language or if perhaps they could be something and this could be the, the dropping of them, could be accepting them, mm. come to a place of like, oh, this is actually a, a perfectly healthy response for you know the entirety of my history and my ancestry and all that but just taking complete responsibility for it, it's a perfectly healthy response to catalyze me into taking great action whereas if i did not have that painful shameful response there'd be no reason to go for a walk and treat myself to nature and relax my eyes and journal and introspect and you know all of those things it's like they're they're actually directly associated to that that point of shame which is it's kind of cool i, I completely agree <laughs> I, you know, I, I really i really do and i i don't know when the point when the point is and i think it's very subjective for everyone when is the point that you do you know let that go or drop it I think it, you just figure that out through the process of going in it. Mm. It's like, you know, the, the story of the bison. I actually don't know if this is true. I think it is. I, I'm sure I verified this once. But the story of the bison goes that when a storm is coming, the bison huddle together and they go into the eye of the storm instead of running away from it. Because they go into it, they go through it, and they get out of it quicker. Mm. Yeah. So I think emotional turmoil is very much the same. You go into it and you get through it quicker. But we, we try and avoid it yeah. because we don't want to go into it. It's like the cure for the pain is in the pain. Ruby. That's it. Yeah. That's exactly it. The, the worst case scenario, I think, would be a person that has been just well resourced enough to compensate and, and kind of meander around the curtails of their pain, you know, and, and live their whole life in kind of this like gray, neutral, kind of just at the fringes of actually going into the storm and getting out to the other side. And I think that presently, you know, we have so much technological resources, at least. We have, you know, food and we have shelter and we have all those things. I wonder if it's harder now to address those scenarios than it's ever been. I think so. I think we have more distractions. There's more distractions. Yeah, I think there's so more you distractions. you keep yourself at that edge. Yeah. And, and then you're 75 years old and you're like, God damn it. You, your I life's missed nearly it. over. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, to some extent. Yeah. But I wonder, right? I wonder with the more distractions, if and I often think about this, then think, okay, so it's 
more difficult. But I mean, every era says it's more difficult. Fifteen hundred. Oh yeah, it's always the end of the world. It's like, is it more difficult? Two years. It's coming. It's coming. I know it. Our generation got the end of the world. I know it. Yeah, I don't. I don't know. (laughs) What I was gonna say was though, let's just say it is more difficult, and you choose to go into the eye of the storm and you take the hero's journey. Does it make it more worthwhile? Maybe. Yeah, what's the goal? I mean, what's the end point? That's always the thing. It's like keep your eye on the prize, and you know, you're, you're, it's like for first defining the goal, and then also perhaps recognizing that the target is just another illusion. I was just going to say, I don't think we have a, a goal. I don't think we're smart enough, wise enough, embodied enough, aware enough to know what an end goal even is. Well, it's just stories, you know. And so that's the thing. Is ultimately the, the the happiest person would be, the, you know, religious people, married people, people that have kind of bought. The doctrine of, of whatever, they can rest in the belief that like, oh, like if I've sorted out this story, <laughs> I, can chill. I don't need to write in all these bits and paragraphs. And it's you know, it's I got a deadline. It's due May twenty first. You know, it's like no, like the story's written. You're good. You know, so I, I wonder if, if ultimately it's it's just coming to to peace with with the illusion. And I feel like I'm kind of getting out there. I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm getting a, a little stony. Well, no, no, that's that's all I got. That's all I got. But I think I think it's it's just like coming to peace with the story. The story doesn't need to be correct. No, and I, I don't and I'm not stating that as though that's a thing. I'm more just like, what do you think about that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I, I think that's part of the the rewriting of our own humanity. Is they have to define correct because well, you know, that's right. Yeah, and I think correct. that's you know we like to think objectivity exists. I'm like, uh, does it? I think objectivity is subjective anyway. Mm-hmm. But the story piece is, I think we get to a point in our lives where we think, well, this I don't need to live in these stories anymore. I'm going to rewrite it or I'm going to tear this book up and start a new one. Which and can be incredibly scary. Very. Because change It can be cold, is, it can be windy, it can be like you on the side of Yosemite. So unfamiliar. And Which we're all having our Yosemite experiences, whether they realize it or not. In different ways. Yeah. D- different degrees of that. Yeah. What about relationships? <laughs> <laughs> the biggest teacher. Yeah. What about relationships? Where do you go with that? How does that hit you? And I could ask a more specific question, obviously, um, but I just wonder, no I wonder, I wonder how you respond to that. <laughs> um, well, I'm a big proponent of relationships. Mm. I don't think it's a matter of are we in relationship. I think it's a question of the quality of the relationships we have. And um, that's, again, defined by you as an individual, you know, your likes, your preferences, what you want to experience in life with people. And I, for me, relationships aren't just to other people or romantic partnerships or sexual intimate union. It's it's relationships to your friends, to your parents, to yourself. yourself. Yeah, you know, to your dreams, your vision, the things that are important to you, to your past, your present, to what, you know, lights you up, whatever. Like what's the relationship you have with that and how do you show up to that, you know, every moment that matters in reference to that relationship. So I, for me, relationships are very important. I spend... So much of my day just contemplating, thinking about, feeling into relationships. I mean, my relationship to my morning routine of late has been, it's been a little disconnected. Mm. And so I've felt disconnected and I've made that mean that I'm lazy or I'm not worthy or I'm not doing enough or I need to be doing more. And so I get into this whole conversation around the, the separate stories around that as well. And that's all because of choosing to focus on this relationship to a morning practice that I've deemed to be very important to me. Yeah, at what point does your morning practice work for you or you work for it? Yep. And that's sort of where I'm at at the moment. And who that. came up with this fucking morning practice yeah. anyway? <laughs> yeah. God damn it. You well, know? Well, I've thought of that too. I've <laughs> thought of that. <laughs> rules! <laughs> I've thought of that too. It's fucking rules. <laughs> so many rules. I'm such a rule breaker, man. I'm such a rebel. We're all naughty children. Yeah. God dang it, I didn't meditate long enough. I didn't journal, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah, so, oh I only did 40 minutes this morning. It's like, ah. Perfect kuwer <laughs> concoction. Loser. <laughs> yeah, that's basically how it goes. Yeah, there's a lot of happy people out there that don't know any about this, like, consciousness, doing the work, biohacking. Like, are they happy? I don't know. Uh, you, I'm not saying that they're not, but are well, they happy? Well, I think the people that typically, it's kind of like the, the thing of you have an outburst of sorts and being like, oh, that's, that's the catalyst to go in and do all of the work things. Mm. I think some people likely live what, you know, maybe 
from my lens, I might deem as like a simple life, which whatever that means, you have to mm. find simple and all things, definition, definition. You know, but they live out in a farm somewhere in Argentina and they've got a few goats and they've got that's epic. I, that, some I don't kids and yeah. I'd be okay with that. Yeah. But would I? I don't know. I would be for a period of time. I know that. I can definitely <laughs> say that. Knowing myself, I could definitely but is that all I could or would do? Here's the thing. You know, we I say we, I I'll say I. Fuck it, I'll say we. Mm. We thrive in familiarity, yet we also need a balance of the unfamiliar, like spontaneity and adventure and excitement, right? The unknown novelty. Yeah, cycles. Yeah, cycles. And I think right now I'm in a cycle of, oh, I just want to be in the mountains or by the ocean and I don't want to do anything. But I know after a very short period of time, a week, two weeks, a month, whatever, I'm going to want to get active again Mm -hmm. in the way that's familiar to me, you know, serving, creating, ideating, whatever that may be, contribution at a larger scale. I mean, that in and of itself is a a clusterfuck as well, in my opinion, too. We get so tied up. I'm very guilty of this. I want to contribute to the world. I want to contribute more. It's like, well, can you actually, can you do that? What does it mean to make impact on a million people? Mm. And why do you want to contribute? Like, I like the idea that you can't teach, what is it? You don't teach what you know, you teach what you are. Something along those lines. Yeah. You, know, you, can you teach where you need to learn the most. Well, that too. Yeah. And that's why a lot of our teachers, which is such a, a brilliant opportunity to get to connect with a lot of you know, teacher-type people via, via the podcast and such, because I get to, to see, and I'm like, oh, like a lot of the people that were my you know, deified, pedestalized heroes that are like, oh my God. You get to meet them, like, oh, okay. The reason they're so good at all this stuff is because they're so fucked up. Basically, basically. <laughs> I'm like, oh, you know, where's the, far- the farmer guy in Argentina? You know, not to say that he, I, you know, romanticizing, yeah. idealizing his life, but sure. just the symbolic farmer guy in Argentina, wherever he is, Don Julio. <laughs> just you know, he guy. doesn't have any of these words. He doesn't have any of the language. He doesn't. He doesn't seem like deep prophetic, whatever. But as far as you know, if you would measure his HRV or his like cortisol levels, <laughs> it's like, well, pound for pound, it seems like that guy's happier. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I've yeah. got all the tools in the world, but I got the, the whole, you know, paralysis by analysis situation where I'm just spinning my wheels in choice. I wonder if in that case, is ignorance bliss? And is that, again, that farmer in Argentina, is he ignorant or is he really evolved? I want to take a brief moment and discuss the vast, beautiful ecosystem of microbes that exist within our guts. Our guts are much more than just food receptacles to break down and digest nutrients. Although it's very important because a lot of the nutrients that you do end up assimilating in your body are a product of the assimilation of those gut microbes. So if you don't have the right microbes inside of your guts, you won't be able to extract and assimilate nutrients from your food. Also, your gut is invaluable for your mood, for your cognitive function, your immune system, incredibly valuable stuff. Many people consuming modern diets end up having leaky gut to some capacity. Inflammatory foods cause big issues inside there. Very important tool that we can utilize in order to heal and restore our guts, which ultimately heals and restores our entire biology and our minds, our emotions. If you're feeling unclear, if you're feeling brain foggy, if you're feeling moody, if you're feeling bloated, if you've had antibiotics pretty much ever, it would be invaluable for you and I and your family and anyone to address the health of their microbiome. So Bioptimizers is a company that I greatly value and have appreciated and utilized their products for the last several years. I trust the sourcing of their product emphatically. And uh, everything that I've utilized from them, I've literally felt a difference upon consuming. So oftentimes there's a lot of things like omega-3 pills or capsules or probiotics or whatever. You know, you buy them, you take them, you kind of cross your fingers and hope they're having impact. We don't really feel anything. When I take the products from Bioptimizers, I actually feel something. I feel more energized afterwards. It actually feels impactful. So their Leaky Gut Guardian is a product that I stand behind, and uh, I think you guys are going to get a lot of value from it. And you can also get yourself a sweet 10% discount by going to leakygutguardian.com slash align. That's L-E-A-K-Y-G-U-T-G-U-A-R-D-I-A-N.com slash align. And you'll get yourself 10% off. If you don't absolutely love the product, then they'll give you your money back, 
100% guarantee, no questions asked, no problem, get your money back, no big deal. So you've got your whole microbiome, your cognitive function, your clarity of thought, your immune function, and your digestion, of course, to gain and uh, absolutely nothing to lose. So jump over to leakyguardian.com slash align for 10% off and heal that sweet, supple gut lining of yours. All right, here we go. Back to the podcast. Bow. Relationship stuff, I think, is, again, you know, we're always vying for whose decade or generation is the most confusing <laughs> or the most jacked up or whatever. But I wonder with the whole polls, masculine, feminine, yeah. and feminism and the patriarchy and all that, where are we at with finding a balanced masculine, feminine relationship with each other? I think we're at the point of fuckery. <laughs> 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 It's such a complex topic, man. Like people, we want to, because we want to make everything easy. We're in a generation of, you want, you want toast? Then we're going to have a toast. It's going to take 30 seconds. It's great. Like we, we've created all this te these technologies to make life faster for us, yet we, we've got less time than ever, right? right? And complex conversations like this, I mean, I, and I'm not using this as an excuse to not unpack it. Let's unpack it. But it is really, into, it's, it's a very layered conversation. Where are we at with it? I think we're at a point where the pendulums have swung in extremes and I think we're coming back into some form of equilibrium or homeostasis with respect that, to how last, we're relating. That'll last for maybe six years. Yeah. I don't even think Maybe we're, four years to match the elections. Yeah. We won't talk about that. <laughs> we will or we won't? We will we'll not. Oh, okay. We can. I just don't know. Oh, God. I don't know what I'm talking about on a, a lot second. of subjects, but that's a subject <laughs> that I like extra don't know what I'm talking about. So yeah, I'm yeah me too. Like, oh. Yeah, no, I have I'm, I'm really no idea. No, it's not a watch. I stopped after BLM, or I should say the B word. Once that hit, I'm like, okay, I'm done. There's I made so much controversy. I made an attempt to say something that felt like it just it it felt from the heart and felt like yeah. like okay, like whew, step back, like intuitively, like what feels right because we all exist within our echo chambers, and you know I have my yes. six friends that all confirm my bias, and then <laughs> Google and Facebook and all that. They just want to sell me ads and they want my eyeballs glued to the screen as much as humanly possible yep. to sell me more ads. And, and so whatever that, I think, they're going to keep yep. on slamming that down my throat. <laughs> You know, so it's really easy to get hot and bothered about your opinion, but you, yep. you know, you've never really been exposed to any opportunity to challenge your own belief systems. And so I was doing my damnedest to to actually feel in, even though, of course, I'm clearly in my echo chamber to like, okay, what feels true? And then I, you know, I, I chirped about it a little bit, and then it was just chaos, and I was just like, okay, I'm good. <laughs> That's not chirping anymore. No more chirps. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So with the polarity stuff, yeah, something that I hear from girlfriends as uh, like you know, friends that are girls is especially successful in quotations financially successful ones that occupy a certain like masculine role you know they're organized they got their shit together they're driven they're and doing yeah, driven yeah and then within that does that make it more challenging to find a masculine man is there is like how does polarity work well, to that direct question it can make it more challenging to find a masculine heterosexual man because generally a masculine heterosexual man in his masculine pole, healthy or unhealthy, let's assume that it's more healthy, is not going to necessarily want to be with a woman in her masculine pole because he doesn't really want to fuck another man. Mm. He doesn't want to have sex with the masculine if he's a heterosexual, masculine, pole-orientated man. And so that doesn't mean that that woman who's driven and goal orientated and successful in the world of uh, material and business and so forth can't still do that, nor she shouldn't do that. She should do that because that's what fills her up. As long as what fills her up is genuine and authentic for her, it's not being driven by some hurt or wound or the seeking of daddy's approval or whatever it may be, right? I'm just, I'm just that's a generalization, yeah. common one, but a generalization. But they can still dance in polarity when it comes to their romantic partnership and their friendship. That's still very possible. So you're just going to get clear on what you want. There's no real wrong or right with it because it's what works for you. Like you're, you are in your masculine pole, right? So you, I don't think you could be with a masculine woman. I don't think it would suit you. That's just my assessment. Am I correct in saying that? Uh, from Yeah, yes. Yeah. Yeah, so polarity exists within all of us. So you have to have that balance. You can have two feminine people being very intimate, 
but there's no charge. There's no magnet. It's not going to last. There may be something that keeps it going and stokes the fire for a period of time, but after a while, it's very difficult to maintain. You have to have polarity. So a woman can be in a masculine. That's not unhealthy. A man can be in his feminine. That's not unhealthy. But it's also not permanent or static. That's right. And what's also your, your dominant pole? Or what's your go-to pole? That, and that's, that's created by our upbringing, our cultural values, the things that we value, the impact that's been had on us by peers and mentors and so forth, our belief systems, our models of reality, how we relate to our bodies and our physicality as well. There are so many factors that influence and impact that. So polarity is just negative, positive charge coming together. But, you know, you know, we're not really taught this shit in school. We're not really taught how to relate at a deeper level, right? We're taught things that are important at some level, but I think we're also not taught how to relate to each other effectively. How do we relate to each other effectively? It's different for everyone, but I think it starts with clearing up our stuff, like clearing up that shadow stuff that we spoke about earlier, making sure that's not leaking into the relationship, getting an idea of who you are in the world. Like we, we are just catapulted into the world and we're told what to do and we're very easily swayed and influenced, whether it be by media, government, family values, education system. You know, we're sheep in so many different ways and we don't really follow our dreams. So we have all these suppressed fantasies that we don't want to live out because we're shameful if we share that with anyone or if we tell someone our fantasies or if we play them out, it's outside of the norm and then we're going to go against the grain and we're going to be in the out group and our nervous systems just freak the fuck out and we're in sympathetic all the time and so we just go with the flow. But the flow doesn't, isn't really what we want. That's true for so many. Well, it's true for some at least, right? I mean, how many people do you know or know of that don't really live their lives in truth? I mean, I'm one of them, I'm sure. I, I think there's aspects of me that I don't live in truth as well. I think we all have to live in truth to the to the degree that you you know yourself. And do you ever really know yourself? I don't think so. I, I, don't, I think it's just a, I think it's a work in progress. Right? It's just, you just you're in it, like you're in it all the time. You know yourself where you're at now, but tomorrow that can change. Yeah. I think you have a fair idea. I think we have a fair idea. But we should go back to that original question. We don't do that self exploration, the introspection, and the being with to get to know ourselves to then make decisions on what we want. Like, think about how many people get married because they think it's the right thing to do. Totally. Or they go to a job, they have a job because it's the right thing to do. Or they have this type of partner because it's the right thing to do. It's like forcing the, the, the circle to fit into the square or vice versa or however it works. Yeah. You, got, you got sold a square at some point. You know, you grew, you, you came out this spirally, amorphous, gelatinous mind body experience, <laughs> you know, and then eventually, you know, come kindergarten and you're, you know, you're, before that, you're, crawling on the ground, you're eating turds up off the ground, you're, you know, putting snails in your mouth and everything's just <laughs> spiral. It's like Alan Watts talk, you know, but like, uh, it. yeah, prickles. He's the best. What, what's he called? Prickles? The one side's prickles, the other side's goo. Prickles yeah. and goo. Yeah. You know, yin yang. Yeah. You know, and so you're pretty much just a bunch of goo for a while. We always carry that goo. You could say that's feminine. And then eventually you get introduced to prickles and linearity and structure yes. and the Roman Empire and yes. pillars and right angles. Nowhere in nature, yeah. except for human nature. And, now, and we're told that's right. We're told that's the best thing and the best way to be. Mm. And then it becomes extreme. Mm. Then it becomes too much. Now the pendulum's in extreme and it's all the way over here. Mm. And what about this aspect of reality that does exist but is not getting any attention? Yeah, and they're both completely... Needed. Yeah. In different ways. They're perfect. At different circumstances. But the, the imbalance and, and the disease manifests it's a product of you know, resting too far on, on you know, the pendulum gets stuck somehow. Yeah. We're like, we need to do... Uh, uh, yeah. It's like rusty. There's a rusty hinge. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah that's, that's exactly what it feels like. And the, for me, the simplicity of that is that... I'll try and break it down really simple. So men, physically dominant, and that physical dominance influences cultural and emotional values that are played out. And so these masculine qualities or characteristics or expressions, right, that are human expressions fundamentally, but that reside more within men, so to speak, have been dominating our society for millennia upon millennia. At some point, men or a group of men or men thought, oh, this is who we are. We can't lose this fear, don't want to lose what we have. So we'll dominate with our physical dominance and we'll make sure that these values are what we live by and we'll ostracize other people and suppress other people to elevate ourselves, to elevate these qualities that we value a great deal. And then, after a long period of time, those are the dominant values in society. Sure. 
But I'm not for, oh, let's kill all men and all men are toxic and what the fuck is that about? Yep. That's just not going to work. That's definitely not going to work. And so we have to strike a balance. I'm not completely sure how. I've got some ideas, but I'm not completely sure how. I'm not even sure if it's going to work because we've been entrenched in a particular way. Like what's tried to happen, as you know, is that, you know, you mentioned feminism and the feminist movements and different waves of, of feminism. The largest attempts have been to say that men are bad or men are toxic or hate all men or men aren't good. And I get where that comes from, from a lot of years of oppression, right, and not being seen and being limited in movement and all of that. And that doesn't work either. So where do we go from there? Well, let's come back full circle to something. Compassion, non-judgment, empathy, love. Can we apply love to those places? Can we all be in it together? Does team exist? Can we even do that? I mean, we've evolved in, is it Hebb's law? 150 people maximum that we can be intimate Dunbar. with? Dunbar. Dunbar, Hebb's. Hebb's. Who the hell is Hebb's? We can look that shit up. Get on the phone. It's something. Dunbar, that's right. Sound there we go. No, the worst. <laughs> so inappropriate. So inappropriate, Aaron. I feel, I feel emasculated. Good. <laughs> Good. 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 That's right. You get into that emasculation, feel it. <laughs> but love, right? Dunbar's law. Anyway, I don't know what my point was, but I think, <laughs> I think the point was around intimacy and, and applying love to, I don't know, Stop with the love part. Forget about Dunbar's law because I can't remember what my point was. I knew it was something damn good. Bird. <laughs> on, on. There we go. There it is. Balance it out. Back into the mystery. Balance it out. Uh, so for a lady that is in that scenario, I don't know that there's that many females that I know that wouldn't at least say on paper that they want a masculine, in quotations, yeah. man. Yeah. So for the person that also does seem to thrive in owning their masculinity... And just, again, it's all definition. So we're defining masculinity as, as being the, you know, the go-getter and yeah, Set of characters building your empire that. and all, all those sure. different things. Is there specific practices that that female could do to introduce more femininity into themselves to embody so that to kind of balance that out to attract that masculine men that they say that they want on paper at least? Yeah, self-care is important. Create space in your day or week to not do anything per se, to be in more flow and more creative energy, practice non-goal orientated action, be in nature. Again, that doesn't mean that men don't go in nature. I just, we were talking about the importance of men actually, you know, being in nature earlier and that we need to connect more to nature, actually. Nature seems pretty darn inherently feminine. It's definitely both. Yeah, yeah. There's and I would a lot say of yes. listening and a lot of... Yeah, oh, spaciousness. Yeah, and, and grounding as well. Around, right? yeah, yeah, the ma the masculine is more in consciousness and spirituality and that connection to the ethereal, whereas the feminine is more grounded, mm. more the you know, the earth goddess connected to all things, sees the the ecological connection and nature of all things as well. Right, the place of all things that the feminine is very present in the process as as opposed to oh, I'm going to achieve this in in two years or two days or next week, and so to practice that femininity, a practice not making decisions. Obviously, all of life is a decision. You're going to choose to lay down or sit down and relax. It's a decision. But I'm talking about the intensity of decision making. Choose to not be completely responsible for anyone and everyone. If you're running a company or you're an entrepreneur and you have 50 people under you, take time off. Give responsibility to other people. Diffuse yourself of some responsibility and just be responsible for yourself for periods of time. If you're looking to be in a relationship or you are in a relationship, create space in your week to be in that relationship, right? To receive. People that are in their masculine a great deal are giving. They're giving and they're doing. Being the energetic of receiving and being. That means there's no agenda to who you are in the world. And some of this is abstract. And that's the whole point. Be in the mystery of that. Or create it yourself. Figure it out yourself. We all want a three-step guide. Yeah, sure. We all fucking want a three-step guide or a five-step guide. Or Sometimes we've got to throw all of that out and just figure it out ourselves as well. Like If you're doing something and you're burnt out and it's too much of that, well, then do the opposite and observe how does that feel. Mm. And what about for men? Well, actually, some information that seems relevant is, you know, there's no such thing as like my other half. You complete me all that. I mean, I guess there could be, but that would be a code code relationship. relationship. Yeah. Personal uh, jinx. Now you can't speak until I say your name for the rest of the show. <laughs> I was tempted to press a button, but I don't want to. Um, so within that, I think there could be perhaps some gray territory of, 
just starting off, you know, develop your own autonomy and independence. And, you know, I'm my masculine and feminine and like I am complete without any other person. You know, I think that that can turn into like a mutated box yeah, that you... Yeah, independence. Yeah. You know, and so at some point, I think that can become... It's like you you build a palace and now all of a sudden you're you're stuck inside and there's nobody else around. There's no yeah. windows and you've, yeah. you've built Super up this selfish. fortress. Yeah. It's like, that's that's great. You're very safe in quotations, but mm. ultimately safety was being in union with the tribe. Mm. And now that's you're right. so damn autonomous, no one knows how to touch you. Yeah. What about that? Well, that's a, the isolated man. That's or a woman. A, or woman. That's a person at the top that's lonely, effectively. I mean, it's I... lonely I, at the top. Lonely, it is lonely at the top. And I think, I, I just... But that's what we desire. Yeah, but do we? <laughs> I, think, I think we think we desire. That's what we learned. Yeah, that's what we learned, right? That's, and that's what we strive for. We have to be the top. We have to be the apex predator. It's survival of the fittest. That's one narrative. I mean, and, it's, it's, it's a legit narrative. But, absolutely, but it's yeah. not the only one. Yeah. There is a collaboration, which is more, again, associated with feminine qualities. You have to define fit. Well, that's another... Survival of the fittest. Okay, well, what is what fit? What does that actually mean? what? And fit for, for, what, for what environment as well. That's another thing. And, and I think there's an element of that. But I think we've evolved where we... Mm, I want to say this. I think a bigger part of how we've survived is through collaboration, not competitiveness. Completely. Darwin said that as well. Yeah. That was his main, that was his main thesis. Yeah. And the one that, that got carried forth was survival of fittest. Yeah. And his main thing was unity. We need each other and we need collaboration. Yeah. That's what makes us the best species in the world or like the top of the food chain yeah. is our, yeah, it, our capacity. It, it, very much so. Yeah, and it, yeah. it's also what gives us emotional security as well. Of course. It's that collaboration and connection, the intimacy that we share through each other. Yeah. You know, if you were kicked out of the tribe, you were doomed. That's you the were, worst thing that can happen. Yeah. I'm and right. that's also where perhaps the, the richest knowledge to encounter could be as well. You know, so the person that goes through that... Now you're, now that, you're being the eternal optimist. Of course, well, whatever, you know, just <laughs> devil's, wrong with devil's that. advocate. <laughs> you know, try to get out of my echo chamber. You know, but it's like the, the person that goes into, you know, you're in your little, your little block by yourself. I mean, that's essentially like a monastery in a sense. You know, and so I think within anything, you can either, it's like what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. So that could crack you. Yeah. But if you're able to write in the pages Take correctly, and you go back it. to the book analogy and you're able to like make sense of it, then all of a sudden it's like, whoa, you can come out you know, this prophetic figure of sorts. And then, you know, maybe who the hell wants to be a prophetic figure anyway? Maybe you just want to be, you know, Juan Jose. <laughs> in Argentina. Yeah, it's like, what do you want? I think though at a point in time in history, you know, a few hundred thousand years ago, a couple of million years ago, you know, humanoids just walking around or crawling around or whatever, there was a point where if we were isolated, we'd, the chances are from a mathematical perspective we'd be dead. And so I don't know if we had the... Because I know we've, we, we still have that genetic matter in us. We still have that, that experience in us epigenetically. You know, Jung would call it the collective unconscious. It's still there. I believe that. I, I think we have that. And so that's really impacted and influenced who we are today. And I think that's in our nervous systems where it's like getting on stage and speaking in front of 100 people, 1,000 people, whatever. It's one of the scariest things to do because if you say something – that goes against the grain. You've got a thousand people at you saying you're wrong, mm -hmm. which I think can be very it's it's an overload for the brain and the body, right? And so I think I think we need each other more than we think. And we've created a world for ourselves, again, based on the survival of the fittest, that is so isolating and so competitive. Because if we're competitive by nature, like really competitive, we want to outdo the other person. That means by default, someone's winning, someone's losing. And sometimes the gap between winning and losing can be really, really hard, really bad for sure. people, really dangerous, unhealthy. Well, it, I mean, it likely goes in a cycle until eventually it, it erupts and then some equilibrium gets found again and then the cycle probably repeats itself. But Have it we only erupted so as a society, do you think? No, I don't think so. I don't think so either. Yeah, yeah. What would you classify as an eruption in society? <clears throat> like a Civil day. war. That could be a thing. You, know. you think that's coming? I have no idea. I don't think my opinion carries enough weight to to speak it. I mean, you know, smart people seem to you know talk about that, but I don't know. But I do think that if we do somewhat exist in in a tinderbox of sorts, and if there was ever a time to divide, you know, the internet and social media and you know mainstream media and all that stuff, it's like it's better at division than ever before. 
which is pretty interesting. But I don't know where that's going to go. My hope is equilibrium, but you know, ultimately, we'll see. I wonder if even equilibrium is sustainable. I often think of that. Say we hit equilibrium, and then what? Do we get bored? Yes. It's like pursuing an abusive relationship because that's what you're comfortable with. Mm. And so then that's, that's a funny thing as well. Like with relationships, are you seeking out what is actually the most, what would be... Familiar fit. What would express to your highest self, your most self-actualized self? You know, what would be the most healing relationship? Or do you seek out the thing that just perpetuates old patterns because that's what's comfortable? We're going to attract relationships and create relationship dynamics in our lives based on the amount of awareness we have of ourselves and our wounds and our shadows. And the less aware we are and the more we come from old trauma and wounding that informs us if we're in a hyper-protective state of wanting to keep safe, we're going to attract unhealthy relationships or very destructive relationships that repeat what we've experienced in order to have a redo of that, to heal the nervous system. Because, again, we're all striving for homeostasis. Every living being is doing, doing that, whether it's a flower out there or us here as human beings. Mm-hmm. And whether we're doing it consciously or unconsciously, we're, we're striving for that. And so the response is just that. The more work that we can do on ourselves, from my perspective and what I've seen in the world, and the more aware we are of who we are and what our needs are, and, and we really healed some old stuff. And let's face it, most of us experience pain and wounding, right? Some don't, definitely. Some have a trauma-free upbringing. And, you know, big T trauma, little T trauma, right? It's on a sure. spectrum. And some people have very, very little, little T trauma at all. And they grow up very healthy human beings. And that's amazing. But they're fewer and far in between, especially these days, with what's happening in the world that we're creating. And there are many fucking amazing things in the world. Let's be really clear about that. Yeah. There are so many gifts that we have. But there, that, that piece of relating, I think, become more fulfilled in relationships when we are less codependent, when we are coming together to create something that's bigger than ourselves and we're not doing it from a place of desperation and fear. Yeah. You, are you familiar with Peter Levine, Awakening the Tiger? He's the best. He's great. He's, he's, I mean, when it comes to trauma, man, he's one of the best in the world. Well, he really is. Uh, I think it might be from his book, or maybe it was Body Keeps the Score. I think it was Awaken the Tiger. But one of the stories that I believe he tells in that is the story of this, this old man that was a war vet. And mm-hmm. every year he mm-hmm. would, do you know the story? He would go and he would enter some quickie mart, whatever, and or a bank or something like that, and he would put his finger under his shirt, and he would he would create this totally benign armed robbery with his finger, and cops would come and he'd create this war scene, and it was like every year, like July sixth, there was some specific date, and eventually they got to the bottom of it. It was like, what what is the consistency of this pattern? And it was like, oh, July sixth, whatever the date was, nineteen eighty, whatever in the past, he went through this wartime scenario where he lost a close friend. And now he is attempting to essentially resurface that, that deeply held wound in the expression of you know, sticking up a quickie mart just to bring that trauma to the surface yeah. because subconsciously what he wants is to be able to heal it. So yeah. he's like creating an ooze, yeah. you know, another opportunity yeah. to heal it because he, at, at the time he didn't have the resources. Yeah, but the issue is he still doesn't have the resources. Yeah. So he's still not healing it because he's not doing anything different with it. He's just reliving it. And that's where we get stuck. We just keep reliving it. And so in relationship, we often don't stay together long enough to actually grow. Now, I'm not saying every relationship that you enter, you should remain in. Definitely not. But if every person were to get really real with themselves, they would say, hmm, did I really learn at the time what I needed to from the relationship that ended? Probably not. And so we leave too early because we can't figure it out. Are we all too close to ourselves? Do we all need a coach? I think we all need external perspective. That's how we've evolved. So you're in a band of brothers, call it, uh, you know, you're in a small tribe a million years ago, 500,000 years ago, 300,000 years ago, whatever it is, and you're not pulling your weight. You're just not, you're not doing what you need to do in a physical volatile environment where you are not the apex predator. And if you don't have someone calling you forward in whichever way they do, however they use their language or whatever it is, then how are you going to be a better version of yourself? How are you going to contribute more meaningfully, not only to your survival, but to the survival of those people? So you can call it a coach, you can call it a mentor, you can call it a friend, you can call it a partner, a dad, someone that sees you, someone that appreciates you, someone that's just willing to say, hey, you could probably be doing better. And 
you're more than welcome to tell me I could be doing better as well. I wonder your perspective on the modern use of psychoactive substances to address these wounds. Overused. Mm. Overused, misunderstood. I like it. I do it. I engage in it. Overused and very misunderstood. Before the industrial era, was that 300 years ago? When these sacred sacraments were being used, the earth was very different. Petrochemicals weren't in the atmosphere. Our, our waterways weren't polluted. The environment was different. Don't get me wrong, I know we've made massive medical advancements and so forth, but the, the synthetics and so forth in our environment wasn't there. And the way that these medicines or sacraments were given were under very different circumstances from what my understanding is. And that's all I have. I wasn't around 300 years ago, or maybe I was in a past life or something, but I can't remember it. I don't know if that exists. So I think it's it's like any industry, man, like anything, there's there's exceptional practitioners and people that administer the medicine or the wisdom or whatever it is, and there's people that are charlatans or not so good. And so I've been very blessed to have I've had amazing experiences with shamans or people that the medicine, the plant medicines are really sacred and I've had amazing experiences on plant medicine where I've been able to connect at a deeper level with myself, with parts of myself that were dormant because it just acts like a mirror, like another perspective. Right? It opens up physiologically, emotionally. And I don't know exactly how. I think we're still trying to figure that out to some degree and I think oh, I hope more science can be done in research can be done in this area. I don't think we'd have to go to research. I think we just have to go to the source of the shamans and the traditions that used to, or that still do, have access to the sacrament and really connect with them at a deeper level. I just don't know if enough people do it. I just see people replace one addiction with the other, whether it's cocaine or heroin or alcohol or cigarette smoking with being in ayahuasca ceremony, you know, 15 times a year. Do you think you really can compare those? Not that compare I'm saying what? that you can't. Addiction to alcohol, cigarettes, porn, whatever, to an, an addiction, again, more words, to attending an ayahuasca ceremony. Because you know, psilocybin and ayahuasca <laughs> and all these you know, drugs that you can mm. put in more of like a, a mind-expanding category, yeah. yeah, whatever, just, yeah. again, more, more word stuff. It, it seems to me like the, the weight of those, they have their own consciousness in a sense. Mm. You know, when you choose to step in to that world, a lot of people, they just don't have the resources to be prepared for a complete, you know, ego death, essentially. Yeah, yeah. It's fucking terrifying. Very terrifying. But alcohol, cocaine, all that stuff, it's like those are, I think, on the other side of the pole where those are, are ego reinforcers. Yes. No and bad good. They're very different it's energetic. Just that's, that's what the tool is. Yeah, yeah. So I'll put it another way. Two things on that. So the addiction piece is I'm replacing one numbing agent or one avoidance strategy with another. One may be healthier. One of my avoidance strategies w would be exercise and fitness and so forth and, and, and competing, competition. I, I mean, by all means, hey, I'm an athlete. I'm healthy, right? But my intention or my, my come from wasn't healthy. Yeah. And so therefore it made don't that... Don't teach what you know, you teach what you are. Yeah. It made that an addiction or I was codependent with that. So that was where I was coming from with that statement. But there's another, another piece to that. The other piece is that I think it's very important because these, you know, whether it's Wachuma or ayahuasca or DMT, which isn't a plant medicine, or can be, but 5 meo DMT, which isn't a plant medicine, but it's still a sacrament of sorts, right? Just a side note, I find it so interesting. How did someone figure, oh, we're going to scrape this poison off the back of the frog? And same thing with, have, like, same thing with the, the, the mixing of yeah. the, the what's, what's the two plants in, in ayahuasca? I always uh, forget. But anyways, I it's, forget. Yeah. Yeah, there's, what is it, what is it Justin? A kruna. Yeah. Like, wh wh how did they figure that out? They, that, said, they, that said, that they said the plants told them. Yeah, that, that, and that's right. Yeah, that's what I've, I mean, phenomenal. Phenomenal. So, I wonder, I wonder, this is a total... Side tangent, I apologize. You no, probably no, had something like meaningful to say, and now I'm going to ruin it. But uh, <laughs> have you heard of the, there's like some concussive disorder thing that can happen when you bang your head in like the perfect way, all the stars align, you fall off your bike, you bang your head, and then all of a sudden you speak fluent French. Yes. Or you can play, called, but you yes. know, Bach, Beethoven, yeah. whatever. You're yeah. like, wow, like you're, you've expressed out this genius. Yep. You know, you were this total bozo, riding your bike down the hill, whack your head, genius. Yeah. 
Like lightning hits you and then your whole world changes and literally you have access to information you never had access to before. Yeah, so it makes me wonder if perhaps we always have access to most all the information or maybe all the information in the world. If it exists, we have access to it. It's just a process of getting out of the way of ourselves. And even though the word genius, that was like ancient Greeks apparently referred to geniuses, that was something that we all have. We all are genius. Mm. We all have our, our, our genius. It's just those inner whispers that can come through. Mm. You know, so I wonder if perhaps like life could be a process of getting out of the way of yourself to allow that those like whispers to come through, and then all yeah. of a sudden you hear the plants or the jungle tell you to to mix. Yeah. You know these these two these two plants out of millions of different vines and whatnot yeah. in order to get this perfect concoction that yeah. we call ayahuasca. Potentially, and and so that actually leads into what I was going to say. Um, but on that. Plant medicines as well do help us get out of our own way. I think there are many tools and techniques that help us get out of our own way. Like sitting in nature for hours helps us get out of our own way. Doing something different helps us get out of our own way. But what I was going to say around the plant medicines, when you ask me what I think of them, I'm a big proponent advocate of them, essentially, very truthfully. However, there's the complexity of our culture the damage that's done during our formative years because of our so many reasons, socioeconomic structures, how people are brought up, the traumas, parents, you know, kids raising kids essentially, parents raising children with their own pains and so forth and the complexities of society today. I'm not saying it didn't exist a few hundred years ago or a few thousand years ago, but those complexities, when we have plant medicines and we're catapulted into that depth of our psyche at that intensity, it's very overwhelming. And so I think overall it probably does a little more harm than good. And so all I'm saying is, yes, engage in plant medicines. They are sacred and, and whatever, however you define sacredness. And explore your shadows, your darkness, and all the various parts of you that you can, because they're probably infinite, in familiar states of consciousness before going to way out of familiar states of consciousness. And another side note, you mentioned something and I thought I'd say is Terence McKenna, super cool. I mean, I think you, maybe you know his theory about we've evolved because of psilocybin. Like, yeah, sure. Plants. Yeah, Stone ape theory. Yeah, that, yeah, and that's awesome. I love that. There's a thing, I don't know who said, what is it? Beware of knowledge unearned is like an idea. So that like a lot of times people that get into, you know, they, they're they a total turd in their life. Then all of a sudden they, they, they're playing Nintendo and they, you know, someone brings over a, a DMT pen, they blast off and they saw God for, for two minutes. Yeah. And then they're like a shaman the next day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, ah, that's, that's, that's dangerous. But <laughs> tell me that's not happening at but, every fucking street corner in Venice and Santa Monica. I mean, it's, 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 it's abundant. Costa Rica and Bali. It's abundant. Yeah. And so I think, I think that ultimately what psychedelics are is they present the opportunity to see into a, a, a window that before yeah. was just the blinds were closed. And now you look down and they're like, wow, yeah. I never even knew that was there. Yeah. Like we live beside a lake. <laughs> the window's been shut. We're beside a lake right now. The window's been shut all this time. You open up, like there's a there's a there's a lake out there. There's yeah. people like wake surfing. Like there's this whole life. Yeah. And then there's the skills that are involved in, you know. Learning to wake surf. The integration, learning, you, you, right? Yeah, you need to actually, like another Alan Watts reference is it takes skills to be able to enjoy life. You know, so as you get better at playing the flute, or maybe you just whack your head and it just happens, you know, or the <laughs> you know, bike, ping pong, whatever it is, as you invest that time and those years and your 10,000 hours, which, you know, that's there's contention around that as well. Mm. But as you invest that time and energy into the thing, then life starts to open up. But you need to invest. There's no shortcut, no three-step, the whatever, right? five-step thing. You, put the effort. you just need to put the damn effort in. Yeah. And then you can have those occasional large, you know, it's like you get the different different levels of ripples. You might do some breath work. That's like you're throwing like a, you know, one-pound stone in the river. You know, and then you go maybe ayahuasca for three days. It's like, okay, you threw like a whole house into the river. You know, and there's there's different ripples along the way. And I think it's it's ultimately it's like, Choose your own adventure, I think. Yeah. Just acknowledge yeah. that they're all tools and they That's demand it. an immense amount of respect. Big time. <laughs> that, that reverence is so necessary. You know, I'm, I'm a big proponent of breath work. It changed my life. Yeah. It really, uh, you know, there was times in my life where I was suicidal and um, breath work was something that I feel really saved me, pulled me out of that and gave me context. And 
I've done various plant medicine journeys and, and non-plant medicine journeys, like psychedelic journeys and so forth. And breath work has been some of the most impactful, you know, very close to 5-MeO DMT experiences. It's been, do you do much breath work yourself? I call it tropic breath work, biodynamic sure. transformation. I mean, I wouldn't say I do much, but I've done you probably experiments? at least 30 to 45 sessions yeah, or so. Plenty. Yeah. yeah. I love it. I think it's game changing. Yeah, you just gotta work for it. You do have to. Sometimes work. as I'm you do have to I'm work like, for couldn't it. I just take, well, you, you, you know, can, drink you a can. little mushroom well, juice? You can. That, that's the that's the ease of access, <laughs> I'm, right? I'm lazy man. <laughs> uh, we're, all, we're all inherently lazy. Don't get me wrong, man. I mean, when I do breath, I'm like, oh fuck, here we go. It's an you hour, hour and a half, in. two hours. You gotta go in. It's like anything, though. You need to be able to invest that energy in order to get to that point that other most people do not arrive. I think we're missing that in society, man. I think we're missing grit. I think we're missing resilience and toughness. Well, Mental, emotional, physical, all of it. We've successfully bred it out through tech. Yeah, yeah. Which is amazing. It's it's not like technology is bad no, or culture culture's a bummer. It's like, whoa, you guys are like, like real good. Like we tried to do a thing. We tried to make life more convenient. Yeah. And now we've arrived at a point where you can lay on a couch have this screen in front of your face, press buttons, and have food, Instant women, satisfaction. anything delivered yeah. to your face. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Instant, like you, you're having like the hormonal. We did. Yeah. That's that's, <laughs> and it's going to come to a point where it'll be implanted, or you just think about it, and it will appear. Whether yeah. it's a three D reality or it's physical, or so, it's. I mean, we're going to eventually get to some point like that, but I think we've undervalued in that process again resilience, grit, toughness. We need that. Oh yeah, they're nutrients. They're staples to the the healthy functioning and circulation of every cell in your body. Yeah, and I think so if that, you outsource that, it's like great you outsource that, but there is a what, cost. Yeah. If you remove anything, then that will ripple through the entirety of the system. Yeah, and, and back to that, you know, just thinking about relationships, like it, it very much lends itself to that as well. And so we don't have toughness, our ability to move through difficulty. We sort of lack that. We lack resilience, our ability to recover from difficulty. So what do we do? We numb or we just check out. We're out. We're done. Relationship's over. And that's part of the we leave too early. What great talk. <laughs> People are arriving. We're eating dinner. <laughs> it's time to go. <laughs> We're about to eat dinner. We're about to engage in some community travel experiences uh, <laughs> to heal our kundalinis. <laughs> Activate and, all, and all seven, five, or 12 <laughs> chakras, depending upon your belief system. That's exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it interesting how the, se the seven chakra system from the 11th century AD, 9th to 11th century AD, is prominent today? Mm, Isn't that interesting? It's coming back. <laughs> it's coming I'm into <laughs> retro shit, man. The 12th. The 12 is coming back. The oh, 12 yeah. chakra system is coming back. I'm down with that too. I'm also into acceptance. <laughs> One love. <laughs> Where should people go from here? What do, we, what do they do? I appreciate you very much, by the way. I'm Likewise, sure. man. Yeah. What's, very much. What's, uh, I'd love to, I don't know. what. You, we got, go to the I'm moon sure with like Elon Musk. That's where programs, we go. Programs, <laughs> like how do people learn more about your, your, your world? Social media at Stefanos Stefandos or uh, growwithsteph, S-T-E-F dot com. Growwithsteph.com to learn more about Steph. I love it. Appreciate you. Likewise, man. Great time. Let's eat some stew. I'm hungry. It's going to be great. I've <laughs> been all hungry right. all day. <laughs> all right. Thank you all for tuning in. And uh, over and out. Hope you guys enjoyed that conversation as much as I did. If you did, you can tag me at a line podcast or Stefano Sifandos at Stefano Sifandos on Instagram. It's a good chance we will reshare your post. And uh, it's just a great way to give us a heads up that you're digging it and uh, to share it with your friends. It also helps with you retaining the information. So if there's a specific insight in there, more for more, share that thing. We'd love to see what you appreciated about the program. Also, if you are a human being that is experiencing any type of knee pain, we created a specific, easy to follow online program for you, breaking down my top exercises that I would do with any client that would be paying me way more than the cost of the program. I think it's $37. And uh, it would be the exact exercises that I would take someone through. Self-care movements, myofascial release movements, ways to create some more spaciousness in and around those knees. So you can find that at alignpodcast.com slash courses. And we also have several other courses on there that you may appreciate. If you're having back pain, we also have the six-week Align Method online program if you want to go deeper into how to effectively drive this physical situation of yours. We never got education on how to effectively 
move our bodies, the mechanics of movement, how to utilize our senses, vision, for example, or hearing in order to tune up our nervous system to feel more energized or also downregulate our nervous system to calm the freak down. So we break all that down and much more breath practices, mindfulness practices, self-care practices, and movement practices are in the six-week online program. Okay. Thanks so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoy your body. I hope that conversation was supportive and I look forward to whispering in your sweet, sultry ear holes next week.